Hello, um, my name is Heidi Morrison. I'm an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse, and I'm also um, on a senior visiting researcher at the Center of Excellence in the History of Experience at Tampere University in Finland. And uh, the topic today, which I'm going to um, talk about, is children and childhood in Middle East history and society since 1800. Um, before we get into the, the lecture, I want to play for you a, um, a short clip. Mm, there we go. Uh, a short clip. And you can um, just listen to this and keep it in mind, and we'll come back to it later at the end of the lecture. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Okay, so the topics um, we're gonna go over today what is the history of childhood? Um, some working concepts for the historian of childhood and then children in the making of the modern Middle East. And then we will <clears throat> conclude. Um, what I'm hoping that you will um, walk away with today uh, is written up here. In this lecture, you will acquire knowledge and lesson plan ideas about how children and childhood have been used as political capital to build the modern Middle East, focusing specifically on the eras of European colonialism, nation building, and US imperialism. And this is a much more detailed outline for today, which I can provide um, as a handout to anyone who would like. So let's begin. <laughs> what is the history of childhood? Um, so let me first begin with how I came to the field. I'll share with you a brief story um, since you are K through 12 teachers and my interest in the Middle East was born in um, high school when my journalism teacher encouraged me to participate in a three week uh, study tour for high school students to Egypt. And the program was made in honor of the life and works of Malcolm Kerr, a former Middle East scholar and president of the American University of Beirut who had a very untimely death due to political violence. He was assassinated in his office as the president of AUB. His widow, Anne Kerr, decided to turn her family tragedy into an opportunity to improve US-Arab relations. So that program that I participated in high school planted a seed um, that went on to grow into becoming who I am today, a social and cultural historian, focusing on some of the most understudied historical actors, uh, children, which is what brings me to the talk today. So I want to express my gratitude to educators like you who see the value and take the time to expose their students to global matters. So what is the history of childhood that I have gotten a PhD in? Well, first of all, what it is, let's begin with what it is not um, to dispel some common misconceptions. Uh, it is not the history of mothers. It is not the same thing as the history of youth. It is not long descriptions of family life. It is not a field only for female scholars. It is not a field that lacks primary sources, even child generated ones. And lastly, it is not the history of liberation, how things, how things used to be so hard, so bad for children, and now things are so much better for children. So it's not the, the history of childhood is not one of progress in which we show how children's lives have improved over time. So what is the history of childhood? Um, for many years, it, it builds on, it's born out of social history. For many years, scholars have acknowledged that children had a history. No, sorry, for many years, scholars never acknowledged that children had a history or were even makers of history. The general growth in studying the history of childhood over the last few decades has related to many changes in our society, 
um, specifically societal attitudes about power and about vulnerable groups. And as these changes in attitudes towards children in our contemporary society evolve and change, so too have ways of writing about the past evolved and changed. So history is as much uh, about the present moment as it is about the past. The history of childhood itself emerged alongside and out of social history in the 1960s. I have no time to go into all that, the birth of the field um, here. Um, there, there was a new curiosity. In short, though, there was a new curiosity among historians to move away from studying the, the grand economic classes like nobility to instead study smaller groups. Um, the emergence then came of uh, what I read up here on the slide, people's history, um, history of ordinary people, history from below, history of the voiceless, and this usually in entailed writing the histories of women, um, minorities, workers, and children. Um, so as historian of childhood Paula Fass uh, articulates, um, she says that by the 1960s, historians were, as I wrote on this slide, no longer satisfied to concentrate exclusively on the more visible topsoil in historical research. So they wanted to dig deeper and look at children as one of these understudied voices from below. Um, of course, the techniques and ways of writing the history of childhood has changed drastically uh, since the 1960s when the field was born, but we don't have time to look at, um, look at all that historiography. Um, so I'll just say a little bit right now about where the field is now, and then we'll dive into some of the work we're doing in the Middle East on the history of childhood. Um, concretely, uh, what is the history of childhood? Concretely, we can say it is what I've written up here. It's what people thought about children and how they represented them, uh, how children experience the past, and how the past informs us about today's children. Now, abstractly, um, when while children, of course, are implicated in the story of children's history, they are not the only focus of the history of childhood. Um, some other more abstract and bigger uh, concepts and ideas that the history of childhood deals with is uh, it decenters, as I've written up here, it decenters the autonomous adult as the normative subject in society. So basically, history of childhood is a statement that says that uh, it questions who we say counts in the world, who we say counts in the past. And also, um, the history of childhood illuminates and engages with all the classic topics, big issues in the historian's range. So questions about making and remaking of nations, questions about emotions in past societies, as well as concepts of kin, questions about law, power, class, race, you name it, you can dig into it through the lens of children. Um, so the history of childhood is not just the story of children, but it's also simply a way of writing how uh, the modern world has become made. And why, why does it matter? History of childhood, it matters because quite simply, children are human beings and they matter in their own right, full stop. But also children influence um, the future and affect society as we all know. So what affects a uh, household in one particular era will also affect um, industry in that era. Um, the way children develop also, the way they develop also affects future generations because of who they become and also because of the memories they carry from their childhood. And there's research now on the way that trauma is imprinted on the DNA of a child if they experience trauma in childhood, which causes epigenetic changes and thus has intergenerational impacts. Um, further, another reason why this field matters is um, if we want to understand global inequalities today uh, in childhood or in the world, we must look back at how we got here. Over and over again, what we see and what we'll see today, childhoods are inversely related to um, usually types of childhoods are inversely related to economic profit or political power of others not related to them. Um, and we also see that ideas about who deserves what in childhood 
really varies in time and place. It's not universally applied. Um, and I like to think like, what's next? If we're gonna study the history of children, what next could we think of to study that's so usually understudied or even under acknowledged in society? Um, so some basic concepts, some terms for you to work with today um, before we get into the history of childhood in the modern Middle East. Um, one is childhood, children as political capital, which was um, of course one of the learning objectives for today to understand how children have been used as political capital in the modern Middle East. So what does that mean, children as political capital? Um, basically it means how have concepts of childhood, so what we think about childhood, how have they been shaped and reshaped to serve the political goals um, of various people in the Middle East? Because um, children have been and are political capital. By capital, I do not mean literally currency, uh, although in some extreme cases, unfortunately, yes, um, children have been used as capital, but instead um, that by capital, I mean that politicians or those serving in leadership positions in society use children, including representations of them, as resources or goods to influence public opinion, policies, and change the present and future society. And I say that without judgment, just could be good or bad changes, just is what it is. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a lecture that looks at adult attitudes towards children and how they use children. If this were like a long course of mine over a semester, we would look, have a big chunk, a big section as well on how children see all this themselves, how they're experiencing this. Um, and so no way in this lecture today is it meant to imply that children are just passive recipients of change at the hands of adults. Um, but I think um, probably in some of your other lectures in this, um, program, you'll get to hear more of the, from the voices of children themselves. Another um, critical tool to think of is a uh, concept to know and that you want to help your students get to know is the idea that age is a social construct. So to understand the ways in which children and childhood serve as political capital in history, we must first start from the basis that childhood is a social construct. Ideas about childhood can be constructed and reconstructed. They're not fixed in stone. They're not fixed in biology. What a child is, according to um, historians. So let us define what a social construct is as it relates to people. In my very simple language, uh, it's social norms, like what we think about people and what we think changes over time about people and it changes over different contexts. So people we see as quote unquote different from us uh, are only so because somebody has taught us that they are different. So reality as we know it is created. So a basic example relates to, for example, a person's gender in American society. There's often this common idea that pink is for girls and blue is for boys, or the idea that women should stay at home and men should work or that women should have a certain jobs, nurse, teacher, and men should have others, like an engineer or construction worker. These roles, these attributes we give to women and men are socially constructed. They're decided on by us to be true. Um, they're not inherent in the human condition from like the beginning of time until now. So <laughs> what a lot, of a lot of people get this concept in terms of like race and gender, but what what historians of childhood bring to the picture is they say this idea of, of a social construct also applies to age. When we say that age is a social construct, this means that who we consider an adult, a child, an elderly person is conditional. For example, someone is only an adult because we have decided in the US that that happens at 18. In Scotland, people are considered to be adults at the age of 16. Or another example, viewing childhood as a time when a person should experience um, niceness and innocence and play, that's not an objective truth or that's not an objective fact that children should and must experience that in childhood. Uh, it's the meaning that we as our society has come to give 
to childhood within the con context of this society we live in. And even at that, we see that this co concepts we have of childhood vary based on which child you're talking about. Sometimes we apply it for some children, but not for others. Um, so there's also an element of power um, that's essential to understanding the social construction of age. There's a lot at stake when groups of people are distinguished as different than others. Controlling the narrative about who other people are is a way of controlling knowledge production in society and hence having power. Children are especially hot topics to want to control the narrative about. Children are vectors of power. Why are they such a fraught over area? Well, for some of the reasons I've already said, and also no society can exist without a means of reproducing knowledge. And that takes place in childhood. A society's concept of childhood and what is offered or not offered to some or all children depends in large part on political motivations. But of course, also it's linked to class, race, gender, religion, um, norms. Further, um, children are so fought over because they themselves are political agents and they embody and are and act on the, the society, act on the future. So I'm today gonna focus on the impact of politics on children, but try to keep in mind that childhood comes at the intersection of numerous societal factors. Um, one last concept that's really helpful to know for those who are studying uh, children is the what is the modern model of childhood? That's a term that gets thrown around a lot, modern model of childhood. So the 19th century was the time of the emergence of the quote, modern model of childhood in the West, like Europe and America, um, North America. The modern model of childhood uh, is, has meant for adults to view children as innocent, in need of protection from adult society, and important for the future of the nation, as well as in their own right. So this modern model originated in Europe in conjunction with the establishment of systematic and mandatory education. So this modern model goes hand in hand with the development of mandatory education, the development of the welfare state, family planning, and the field of pediatrics. And it also goes hand in hand with institutions that developed around this concept. Um, it also goes hand in hand with uh, other tangible changes, such as extending the length of childhood and the number of children and families decreasing. Uh, the idea that the, that the ch children should be, childhood should be spent in school, separate from the world of adults, um, and that they should be protected and, and a time of innocence really came as a result of um, many factors being one, a reaction to the industrial revolution in the West. Also the, a growing middle class made this possible. Uh, and the ideas of enlightenment thinkers, the romantics, and also nationalisms, competing nationalisms um, drove these changes in concept of childhood. We don't have time to go into all this today. Um, but these two pictures help sort of illustrate this shift in thinking it happened in the 19th century. Children in the West, children uh, here we see children working in, in the coal mines, and here we see sort of the romantic vision of the idyllic child, ide uh, an ideal childhood, very different images, same time period, um, but they're making a statement. Um, of course, children have always had a compulsion to work around the world, around time, but the change that happened in the 19th century was that children were no longer working because of the Industrial Re Revolution, they were no longer working for or supervised by their immediate families. And they had a severe kind of work um, changed. And that is impact represented here. And this is sort of the, the response uh, that is fueling changes in conceptions of childhood. Of course, the development of all these sets of beliefs, they don't just develop smoothly. It's not like um, things just didn't get better and better for children. Things go backwards, upwards, sideways. For some children, they go this way and that way. Um, there's not always a clear destination in view, but generally these are the trend, the trend in the development of the modern model. So I was thinking um, for your students, 
that before you even um, sort of get into some examples of children in history, uh, and it might be good to introduce to students if they haven't already been introduced, this concept of a social construct. Um, because before we can look at the history of childhood, it's important to get students to understand that age is a social concept construct. This is probably something they haven't thought about. They might be familiar with the idea that race is a social construct, like the, the attributes we, we say are to this people from these, this continent, those are only because we've said that they, they have those. So, but I don't think people or many of your students probably haven't thought about age as a social construct, that what we expect of people at certain biological markers varies in time and place. Of course, much like concepts of class, race, and gender. So what I might encourage uh, a sample, you can build off of this, um, would be to have your students watch this um, film, uh, Babies, <laughs> and um, then reflect upon and share their thoughts on this quote by historian Colin Haywood. Uh, Most people assume that their own ideas and practices concerning childhood are natural and are shocked to discover that other societies diverge from them. And we don't have time to uh, watch this full trailer here or the film itself, but basically it follows four babies in four different parts of the world and shows how they grow up um, differently. Even though they're the same age, <laughs> same size almost, there's, there's different expectations that each um, family has and each culture has for the children. I can show you just a brief second of it to give you a feel. Um, so it, 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 it goes in Africa, um, Japan, California, and um, Mongolia, I think. Okay, so you can look at that on your own if you want. But the, the point is to have your students um, use this as a launching point, this film, to reflect upon and um, share about what people think about childhood, how it's a social construct, how it varies. And um, what that you can ask your students, like what are the similar, what concepts are similar to the ones that they hold that they see in these videos? Or what scenes do the students feel a sense of ethnocentrism that their way of raising a child is the right way and other ways are dangerous or harmful? So the point is to get the students to understand that there's no one definition that adults hold about childhood that's universal and natural. It's always being constructed and rethought and applied differently to different children. All right, so let's get into some um, stuff. We've looked at what is the history of childhood. We've looked at a few working concepts for the story of childhood. Now let's look at children in the making of the modern Middle East. Um, children and childhood are impacted by and at the heart of change in the modern Middle East uh, history and society. When scholars talk about the making of the modern Middle East, um, they traditionally do not account for the role of children. But for example, if you look at all these books about, about uh, the modern Middle East, these textbooks that are used all the time in classrooms, you're not gonna find any chapter uh, dedicated to children, let alone references in the index. Um, but when a scholar stops to look for children in the archives of Middle East history, children are everywhere. Um, this omission is not just specific to the Middle East. And by the way, um, you would find in a lot of these books references to youth um, because particularly since post 9-11, there's been an obsession uh, with fears about the supposedly dangerous Arab um, street young people. So you might find references, you will find references to youth, but probably not children. Um, so there are many ways I could have structured this lecture. Um, one, simple way would have been just to document things that have happened to children in, in the last you know, few centuries. 
But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to push you to grapple with some of these concepts that I uh, introduced earlier in the lecture, social construct, political capital. Um, so I'm going to push you to try to follow an argument. And that being that <clears throat> knowledge production about childhood is political capital. So what a society thinks about children is very much linked to power structures in society. So we'll start and we'll look through three different eras, the European colonial era, nation building area, and US imperial area. <clears throat> Again, this is the learning outcome, just to reference back to it. So European colonial era. Um, we'll look, for example, at Egypt. Um, the majority of children <clears throat> in the Middle East entered the modern era, the 1800s, um, under the thumb of direct or looming Western imperialism, often in the form of colonization. Colonialism is a process whereby sovereignty or authority over a territory is claimed by a colonial empire and the social structure, government, and economic economies within that territory are changed by the empire. So Egyptian children um, as fuel for factories and imperial imagination. So we'll look, so I wanna to explain to you a little bit about the use of children that made colonialism possible um, by colonial rulers in Egypt. In Egypt, um, British colonialism, which officially, well, protectorate it's also called, um, officially began in 1881. And it was driven in large part by a search of cheap raw materials, namely cotton, to fuel the factories of England. And children were crucial to this endeavor. Um, of course, the British occupation was also driven by other factors like wanting to take control of trade routes and, and make a market for their own goods. Um, but in a, in a sense, we can say that Egyptian children um, footed the bill of Europe's industrial revolution. Um, not just Egyptian children, many children around the world uh, who are under colonial rule. So um, let's, let me explain a little bit about how um, the children were so implicated in the colonial, um, in the cotton production process. First, we have to look at the start of the 19th century when uh, Muhammad Ali, um, ruler of Egypt at the time, wanted to create an Egyptian state independent of the Ottomans. And he converted the Egyptian economy, cotton economy, to one that was owned by the state. He made the economy most, almost exclusively based on cotton. Children who had always helped families in some way or another on the land in Egypt became um, like their parents in that their work was, became for the benefit of the state, for Muhammad Ali, for the state. Uh, Muhammad Ali, for example, prohibited family migration to cities to keep them on the land. He conscripted child laborers. He ordered Egyptian peasants to go cultivate cotton to the exclusion of other products, um, which he then bought and sold to British textile manufacturers at a higher price. Um, the key is that the profits under Muhammad Ali went back into the country itself to develop it in theory. Uh, and Ali did not, Muhammad Ali did not create external debt to drive this development. He was trying to use internal resources of labor. But the second half, of the 1800s saw a radical shift uh, in who benefited from the state cotton industry and who these children were working for and for what purpose. All these successors, um, for various reasons, fell into debt with Britain uh, because they caved to British pressure to adopt free trade and dismantle state monopolies. So Britain was then able to begin its official occupation in 1881. And it continued a lack of mechanization, investment in mechanization and just wanted to continue the abundant labor to produce the cotton. But the profits did not go back into Egypt. Um, they went to Britain. Under the British, um, Egyptian cotton was produced as a labor intensive good in an economy with abundant labor, including children. As opposed to in Britain, um, it was a capital intensive good in an economy with abundant capital that could then be invested in the mechanization of production. Uh, it, between 1880 and 1950, the, 
the time of the protectorate, Egypt, uh, British protectorate in Egypt, Egyptian boys accounted for 35% of the total labor in crops in Egypt. Political scientist, uh, Elise Goldberg, has said it is thus no wonder that powerful England easily subordinated Egyptian interests to its own and exploited the Nile Valley to provide the Lancashire mills with raw cotton harvested by children. The British had a lower age of admission to work in Egypt than they did in Britain. The earliest protective legislation in Egypt was enact, enacted um, by the British in 1909 to hit, prohibit the employment of children below the age of nine in certain industries. Um, it was generally seen as ineffective, but the first, this is by comparison with the first product, protective legislation uh, for Britain, British working children was a century earlier in 1803. So when I talked earlier about this modern model of childhood, um, it was <clears throat> the British took actions to create institutions and systematic um, changes like these laws, um, like a century earlier for the children in Britain. It took it still in Britain, it took a long time um, to, to get into effect. But the actual laws, sometimes when laws are written, laws are written, but the reality is different. But in, in Egypt, it wasn't until 1909 that they got their first labor laws um, to supposedly protect the children. So the difference between child labor in Egypt and in Europe was that while the conditions to make it recede in Britain decreased over the 18th century or the 19th century, what the British colonialism did was it only increased the conditions and exacerbated the conditions in Egypt. So the Egyptian children did not shift at the same rate as European children away from labor towards schooling, towards this modern model. Uh, Egyptian children became locked in agricultural patterns that still unfortunately exist today. Generally speaking, uh, European colonists in the Middle East made little effort to invest in universal free and mandatory schooling, sort of a, a pillar of the modern model of childhood, uh, nor did they try to raise the legal work age and limit permissible types of work. So colonized children did not undergo the same process of schooling uh, as Western children. Public schools were usually closed to indigenous or uh, local children. And as I said, schools are not made compulsory or free. Or if they did open up to local children, they were underfunded or run on a voluntary missionary basis. Um, and schooling options that did exist for local children um, were, were generally had teachers that were untrained. Uh, and the goal was to take away the ways of the children and civilize them into European ways. So as we see, getting back to my original argument that I'm having you follow, um, children are part of the skeleton, the framework of how colonialism worked in Egypt. Um, it's not just children itself, but it's also even the concept of childhood. Um, different constructions of what constitutes a child were at play by the British at this time, right? So there's a construction that's expected of the children in England, but a different um, construction of what a child should be in the colony. Um, colonial authorities and missionaries took actions and endorsed a rhetoric about children in the Middle East that veered vastly from the new model of childhood emerging in Europe. Colonized children experienced a drastically different type of childhood than their counterparts in the metropole, uh, where philanthropists and government authorities were at this time advocating radical reforms in juvenile work and school expectations to conform to this new modern model of childhood. Um, so what caused all this? Colonialism was not driven just in the 19th century by new technologies like advances in shipbuilding and transportation, communication, medicine, and science. There were also new ideologies that served as quote unquote tools of empire. And one of the most influential ideologies was pseudoscientific and it was social Darwinism or the classification of separate races along an evolutionary scale of who was most superior. Uh, the cultural and intellectual climate of colonialism is part of this redefined the Middle Eastern child 
as inherently different than the Western child. British depictions of Egyptian children often focused on their supposed biological um, strength to work as farmers. And this is seen in many ways. Um, the, what we find is that the British often claim that Egyptian children reached puberty earlier than their Western European counterparts. And they said it was due to the climate. And so thus they could work earlier at a lower age. Also, they said Egyptian children had extraordinary skills to work due to the Egyptian soil, which they were raised on. And they said Egyptian peasants had a physical aptitude different than their European counterparts. For example, they said Egyptian women could carry heavy objects on her head because of her pelvic bone structure. And they said that uh, the Egyptian children had a lower intellectual ability, which made it impossible for them to contemplate advanced institutions. Um, so they should just work the land. And they said anyway, the Egyptians don't want education. They shouldn't. Even, they don't even want to send their kids to school, so they're unwilling. And you can see here. Uh, in this slide I put up here, it's a, it's a series of commercial slides that was produced by an American company but uh, in Egypt, but distributed in Europe in 1896. It shows a group of children naked sitting in the dirt, and it really conveys this idea that mothers are negligent, they, they're, they don't want to go to school, um, they bear hordes of children, and they're just, uh, it's not a place to introduce the modern model of childhood. And even in this ILL report um, that I put up here, uh, it says from 1932, it would obviously be impossible to transplant to Egypt the highly developed social and industrial systems which exist in Western Europe. The lines along which Egypt may be reasonably expected to advance in the immediate future can only be determined by reference to the fundamental features of her present condition. So children were battlegrounds on which the war of, wars of colonialism ideologically were fought. Um, and even, we don't have time to go into today, but even the country itself of Egypt was represented as childlike in need of development by the colonizers. Um, and you can see this use of political children as political capital, this use of children as political capital, also in, in the response of the Egypt, many Egyptian leaders to these um, colonizers. Egyptian anti-colonial leaders responded to colonizers' use of children by themselves pushing for schools, pushing for laws, and pushing for new representations of children. Um, the same amount of effort expended by the colonialists to show racial inferiority was expended by the nationalists on the national subjects to improve them for the social welfare of the nation. So this took the form of Egyptian intellectuals developing frameworks to strengthen Egyptian children and child rearing paradigms, to fend off the colonizers through, um, they often did this through indigenous conceptions of child rearing grounded in local heritage. So saying that we have, if we look back in our ancient Egyptian roots, our Islamic heritage, our Arab past, uh, we can authentically um, find features that are similar to the modern model of childhood in the West without mimicking the Western model. Um, one sort of quintessential example is when nationalists said that the prophet Muhammad uh, was the ultimate boy scout. Um, or sometimes these reformers would ground, um, ground their calls in what's called adab literature. That's literature from the medieval period in the Arab world collected from the Islamic world collected it's a collection of medical writings, legal writings, etiquette writings, and it paid attention to, um, and these nationalists would pay attention to what Muslim thinkers in the past in this adab literature said about child rearing, educating, more medically treating children um, to develop the whole community um, gradually. Taha Hussein, one of the leading um, uh, reformers in Egypt said, if the boys grow up weak in mind, corrupt of opinion, malformed of thought, unable to understand and make judgment, ready to be influenced by everything he encounters and in compliance with everything that prevails upon him. He is dangerous to himself and his nation because he is dangerous to the social system. So you see very concretely children as political capital. 
to build a nation. So lesson plan idea, sort of to um, <clears throat> pull back a little from this colonial era. A social theorist uh, Shish Nandi writes that, as I wrote up here, colonialism was produced and driven, quote, by persons and states of mind. So you might want to ask your students, what does that mean? States of mind. How is colonialism driven by a state of mind? And what and for this, I'm referring to the ideologies that I talked about and uh, that fuel uh, colonialism, not just you know technology. Um, and then ask the students, you know, how how do these states of mind relate to ideas about children? And um, <clears throat> so you want to talk about power as being something that is not just enacted through violence, power and control, but through hegemonic thought systems that get people to buy in. Um, so you could, I, I can share with you these um, primary sources, but here, for example, you could have them look at two different um, primary sources. One, Lord Cromer's Modern Egypt. It's a document by Lord Cromer, uh, a British statesman who played a critical role in the finances and governance of Egypt. And here in this document, there's a section in which he talks about um, attitudes of the British towards educating children. Uh, I just put up here some snippets of it so you can get a feel of, think of the tone he has. Um, you can see, um, to, uh, here, what Europeans mean when they talk of Egyptian self-government is that the Egyptians, far from being allowed to follow the bent of their own unreformed propensities, should only be permitted to govern themselves after the fashion in which Europeans think they ought to be governed. Um, uh, let's see, to suppose that the characters and intellects of even a small number of Egyptians can in a few years be trained to such an extent as to admit of their undertaking, the sole direction of one of the most complicated political administrative machines is absurd, basically he's saying. So he's talking about what kind of training um, Egyptian children should be given and what they are capable of having. And um, you could have the students look at these, this document, which I can provide, and say, like, what, what does he think is the potential for children, uh, of Egyptian children? What are his motives for this colonial ruler for educating Egyptian children? What kind of education does he think children deserve in Egypt? And of course, how does that vary by their gender and class? And then this sort of perspective could be put in contrast for the students with um, these sources, which I can also provide, which are um, a sliver of children's literature um, in Egypt that were produced by Egyptian leaders. Um, and they were developed for children and you can see what kind of an image are they putting forward and sending about Egyptian children. Of course, it's not a completely homogenous image. It varies by class and gender. But overall, these local people were saying that Egyptians can strengthen their country through children, sort of the opposite of what Cromer is saying. So you can ask them, looking at these pictures, what, what, do, what does this literature show think of, of the potential of Egyptian children? What are their motives in this literature for educating children? What kind of education do they deserve? Are these children seen as potential leaders capable of learning technology? Here you see a typewriter, yes. Are these children capable of being outside uh, the, the realm of the work world? Yes, um, they can be scholars, they can engage with radios or record players. They can even learn and be trained to rule themselves. So these different representations, this one and, and these, of children are, of course, irreconcilable. And we see simultaneously then two different fights over childhood to try to create two different futures of Egypt. So let's move on now uh, to another era. Um, let's look at the nation building era. Uh, Professor um, Nadra Shalhub Kavorkian at the Hebrew University uh, coined the term unchilding um, to refer to the ways in which Israel exploited and continues to exploit Palestinian children to affirm its control and achieve its government goals. Essentially to build and maintain the state of Israel, she argues in this book, Israel has used 
done this on the backs of Egyptian, or sorry, Palestinian children. So it's similar to the argument before of um, the British building colonialism on the backs of the Egyptian children. Here it's Israel building itself as a nation on the backs of Palestinian children. Um, so we don't have to go in, have time to go into all the detailed history of the, the birth of the state of Israel. Um, but just as I give you a little bit of backdrop about um, the formation of Egypt, I'll just say um, for Israel, um, with intensifying anti-Semitism in Europe and in an era of the world being divided up into new nation states at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, European Jews created a political movement called political Zionism, which intended to establish a homeland for the Jewish people in the ancient biblical land of Zion, from which Jews had been originally expelled. The problem that the political Zionists faced was that there were people, the Palestinians, already living there, and the overwhelming majority of whom did not identify with Judaism. So the land was not empty. You know, there's not this myth that uh, the Jewish people, Israel, came and made the desert bloom. Th there were people there living in the Ottoman Empire, uh, thriving. Um, from the outset, political Zionism faced a challenge in that the indigenous people where they wanted to make a sovereign Jewish state, uh, Palestine, were ex experienced their own historic homeland through their own individual and collective identities, which was not Judaism. So through uh, ethnic cleansing, the details I don't have time to go into now, but I can give references to books that detail this, um, Israel established itself as a Jewish state in 1948. And scholars have well documented that the early Zionists in alliance with the British who held the mandate over Palestine from 1920 to 1948, um, disenfranchised the existing majority Arabs, transferred the land to Jewish people and ultimately expelled Arabs. According to historian Ilan Pape, the Nakba, this is that period of the establishment of Israel, fits the contemporary definition of ethnic cleansing and international law since it was organized, quote, an organized effort to render an ethnically mixed country homogenous by expelling a particular group of people. So children, we'll get back now to Nadra's book, once they have this backdrop, uh, Palestinian children are deeply into, in, enmeshed in this formation of the state of Israel. From her book shows, from massacres to discriminatory policies to systematic Israeli state crimes, attacks on Palestinian children have been and continue to be a central component to the building of the Israeli state. Um, uh, the Israeli state has targeted Palestinian children's welfare and education. And there are many examples in her book to um, that illustrate this. For example, she has testimonials from the Nakba, the period when Israel was formed, in which Palestinian children are what Nadra calls, quote unquote, caged. They're trapped in unprotected spaces. Um, the Zionists did not account for children as deserving different treatment um, and she goes through these, this sort of caging of the children up to um, modern day. Um, <clears throat> and, and I don't have time to go into all the details, but there's also a scholar, Hedy Viterbo, uh, who published, has published research on how Israel constructs the age of majority differently for Palestinian children than Israeli children, particularly in the occupied territories where they face different juvenile justice systems. So since 1967, occupied military zones, um, Israeli occupied military zones disrupt the movement of Palestinian children, uh, disrupting their access to schooling, medical care. Uh, according to Defense Children International, harassment by Israeli settlers of Palestinian children going to school and intimidation, arbitrary arrest searches and assault of Palestinian children by Israeli soldiers at checkpoints create fear in the children that impedes education. And there's many other examples that could be going on, such as making the healthcare conditions um, quite impossible, and then blaming the parents, the Palestinian parents as being ill-equipped without looking at the larger structural causes of this inequality. So um, in this book, she argues that from conception, the conception of children um, to death of children, that is, the, these bodies, these children's bodies are being used um, 
by, in power play. And I have this brief excerpt from an interview she did uh, where she talks about how, what I mean by a death, that um, there's this child that was killed by Israeli soldiers, Palestinian child, but they, Israel refused to release the body. And um, she maps how power is being mapped onto the body of the child and um, to advance political power. The case uh, of um, Nassim Abulumi, who was um, uh, killed here in the old city uh, in, in September, and how his sister was uh, anxious to, to waiting for the, the release of his body after he was uh, shot and killed, uh, you know, extrajudicially here in, in the old city. And your sister, 11 years old, we were sitting in the backyard of their home. And we were discussing, we were trying to convince the Israeli court system to release the body. And uh, the question was, who can go to the court and whether we can convince? And the father was not allowed to cross to the court because he is an ex political prisoner. So the mother was talking to me. And his 11 year old sister came in and asked me, you know, can you explain to me? They killed him. Yeah, and she is not with us. How can they try a dead body? Now, when you hear that phrase of trying a dead body, perceptions of children that are listening to the voice of the so-called legal system, the court, that that court that belongs to the system that not only uh, killed a 14-year-old kid who is less than 36 kilograms, and also is preventing, you know, preventing the release of the, of the dead body to the family. And her question is, how can they unchild him when he's a dead body? How can they ride over his dead flesh, their power? And that's exactly where I see the two things. Number one, that children are able to detect this, the need of them. Uh, Israeli settler colonial system and racial, racialized victim, uh, violence through law, through bureaucracies, and so on. But how children are constantly challenging it and, and interrupting that unchilding. Because for her, uh, of uh, the, uh, the case uh, of. Okay. Um, so, um, what's causing this? Again, we see similar to what happened in Egypt, there's reasons, there's an ideology about children um, that um, children is be, are being conceived of as inherently different Palestinian children than Israeli children. Um, and Nadra explains in her book that Israel seeks to, uh, to eliminate the future generation of Palestinians by treating Palestinian children as nobodies who are unworthy of global children's rights and at the same time treating them as dangerous and killable bodies, potential security threats, needing to be caged and dismembered physically and mentally. So what we can see, getting back to the argument for today, is that childhood is being made and unmade by those in power. So just as we saw in Palestine, Egypt, of course, though, Palestinians resist, as Nadira um, referred to, and they resist through the child. And they don't resist as the stereotype has of, of making mini suicide bombers or breeding violence, little snakes as some of the Israeli politicians have been said, but instead there's a, there's a way that Palestinians are resisting through educating their children. Um, highest, uh, having, um, Palestine has some of the highest literacy rates in, in the Middle East. Um, also by maintaining a sense of normalcy for these children through their family structure. They're and perse persevering and not giving up um, these, through their children, they are resisting. Um, this is something I call uh, lived resistance, which I currently have a book I'm working on about this. So lesson plan idea, and then we'll get into the last part. Um, lesson plan idea, one aspect of the illegal occupation um, with a very severe impact on children, the concept of childhood is, are the Israeli military courts? in the occupied territories. They lack uh, due process guarantees. 
and majority of children are denied access to their family or a lawyer uh, until their first appearance in a military court. So you, uh, one suggestion could be um, to screen for your children or your students, uh, this film called Imprisoning a Generation, uh, which can be got, I think, by emailing the director, I think her name is Zelda on the website, and then engaging with, um, she already has a pre-made discussion guide, which is excellent and like 10 pages long. Um, and it asks questions like, um, how are Palestinian children, um, how are their families being impacted? The family structure that's stripping their families of the ability to protect. How do children perform liberation through the children in childhood? Uh, how, so um, we don't have time to watch the, ah, the, this whole um, trailer, but you can go on the slideshow and watch it. But it's basically following four Palestinian children caught up in the Israeli courts. No. Well, I, I won't play the rest of it. You can go back and watch it if you want. There. Okay. So lastly, I want to look, following this stream of argument about using children as political capital, I want to turn to um, a more modern period, the US imperial era. Um, all these periods overlap. They're not like first, they start and end at a certain date. Um, they're, they're sort of overlapped and intermeshing. But the period of US imperialism, at least, or what some refer to as neocolonialism, um, began in the early 20th century um, with America's interest in the huge oil reserves in Saudi Arabia. And it was followed by support of Israel's statehood, and it intensified in the Cold War and has really culminated in the adoption of American neoliberal policies across the countries of the Middle East and North. Africa from the 1980s until now. And it's these neoliberal policies that <clears throat> the Arab Spring uh, very much was um, speaking out against. So let's look at this a little bit through the case study of Iraq. Um, again, like with Egypt and <clears throat> Israel, I'll give a bit of a background on Iraq. And then we'll see where children are tied into this, um, what's happened there. Iraq um, is an invented country. Uh, it was pieced together. Uh, it was pieced together. Uh, it's pieced together three Ottoman provinces of different ethnicities: the Kurds, the Sunnis, and Shiites. And it was done by the British um, <clears throat> after World War One, and when the Britain was carving up the Middle East, they pieced together these three provinces and called it Iraq. And they appointed an Arab leader who had never been to Iraq, this area called Iraq before. It was so new and it's such a new country that they even played um, God Save the King um, for the national anthem because they didn't even have a national anthem yet. Um, and they appointed this Arab leader to be the country of this new country called Iraq, to be the leader, because um, they owed a favor to him. Um, so they gave him this position and then they made him guarantee special military and economic control of the country to the British. In the 1950s, there were a series of coups against the British-backed monarchy until the Ba'ath Party uh, under Saddam Hussein consolidated power in the 60s and nationalized industries like the oil. So children though, children from that point, from the beginning of Iraq till now have been implicated in, in the politics. Schools particularly is what I wanna look at are battlegrounds. Um, Professor Sarah um, Persley has written a book, which I put up here, about how the various rulers of Iraq have time and time again launched projects in the name of developing the future of Iraq. And these projects have reshaped children. And she also looks even more than children. She looks at how it's reshaped family relations, how it reshaped gender in everyday life. The new state authorities uh, after the British adopted sorry, the new state authorities in the 50s that came after the, the British um, adopted the same strategy as their British advisors. Um, and that they, they use children to stand for the country's future. Um, per, this uh, Sarah personally finds that the British authorities um, when they were in control tried to use education 
um, to keep Iraqi students docile and segregated. Um, they would recommend practical and vocational training, as well as skills related to child rearing to be taught to women. Whereas uh, local intellectuals um, in Iraq were demanding a uniform curriculum and they were against corporal punishment for secondary schools who participate in political protests, um, the British were trying to keep Iraq as an agricultural country. And um, I can play you a short clip from her interview that helps uh, illustrate what I'm talking about here. Okay, yeah, I think um, I'll say two things about al Husri and my approach. I mean, one is that to the extent that I focus on his ideas about um, sort of pedagogy and psychology rather than Arab nationalism, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I do think he, you know, uh, he makes some really interesting arguments and um, um, sort of analytical interventions that actually shaped my analysis of events in Iraq. Um, you know, I think his critiques of the 1932 Monroe Report, for example, are really cogent and important. The 1932, it was a, a, a U.S. team of education experts that came to Iraq in 1932 um, and basically criticized the Iraqi education system, which al husri had been instrumental in establishing for um, giving all uh, children across the curriculum, across the Iraqi national space, the same um, education and content. And specifically, they objected to girls and boys having the same education or the same following the same curriculum and urban and rural boys following the same curriculum. So those are the two kinds of difference this U.S. team was interested in, was the, the sexual difference and the urban rural um, difference. Um, El Husseini uh, criticized the Monroe Report, um, basically arguing that it was um, sort of just repeating in this American pragmatist, you know, progressive sounding U.S. pragmatist uh, language, pragmatist educational philosophy, um, was actually just kind of replicating colonial approaches to education by arguing, for example, that rural boys needed to study agriculture, not um, have any sort of intellectual type of education because it was going to raise aspirations that couldn't be fulfilled and encourage them to move to the cities. He thought that was a colonial type of education of just trying to um, enforce manual labor on the children of the colonized. I think that's a really important critique of the Monroe Report. Yeah. And actually that what he suspected of the Monroe Report, that it was just repeating narratives, colonial narratives that were already established um, uh, from earlier colonial context is absolutely true. He didn't have time to go research it. I did, you know, he was absolutely right. They were just repeating um, actual descriptions that they had used, you know, in, in reports on the Philippines and China and Latin America, you know, this was a global narrative of um, education systems and sort of this anti-intellectual argument um, for teaching manual labor to um, children in, you know, outside the West, basically. So okay, that's enough <laughs> for that. Um, but basically, after um, the foundation, like the, the liberation of Iraq from the British um, and the American reformers that worked alongside them, um, <clears throat> the, um, children were continued to be used um, by Saddam Hussein. I don't have time to go into all his um, stuff with schooling, but he did um, an important component of the Ba'ath Party in Iraq was free state-sponsored education from primary through university levels. Uh, in schools, children, students learn the Ba'ath Party ideology of secular nationalism, socialism, and freedom from imperialism. Um, and these, Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party used schools as a site of social reproduction, of embedding values. So they, you know, he too is using um, children as political capital. Um, and then this can be elaborated on even more if you look at the Iran-Iraq war and how um, <clears throat> and, uh, Sunnis versus Shiites are, are represented. Um, and then again, um, uh, through the schools. Um, but then we want to jump a little bit to when Iraq uh, invades Kuwait, um, which the US was afraid it would affect the oil in Saudi Arabia. Um, and this was led to the Gulf War, which was the destruction of Iraqi infrastructure. But uh, the point I want to focus on are the 13, 13 years of sanctions in Iraq that were driven by the United States. And these sanctions um, came on the backs of Iraqi children. Um, infant mortality rates, severe malnutrition in Iraqi children uh, with up to 32% the stunted growth during these 13 years. 
Iraqi teacher salaries fell from $450 to just $3. It was a full four, fourfold increase in cancer in children due to the depleted uranium from the Gulf War. Hundreds of thousands of children were dying of diseases, not able to be treated due to the sanctions, which brings us back to the clip which I opened up this um, lecture with. And the education system, uh, which was once considered actually one of the best uh, developed by the Ba'ath Party in the Middle East, degenerated. Uh, the UN Children's Fund predicts, predicted that there would be 100% primary school enrollment for boys and girls um, had um, the, the previous rate of employment develop, or educational development continued without the disruption from the sanctions and then the following war. So of course you remember the quote from um, Madeleine Albright in which she says that um, this is worth it. Um, and then following these sanctions came the war on Iraq in 2003 um, by late 2003, it's estimated that 50% of Iraqi children suffered from PTSD, CAF, and there were virtually no child psychologists. Um, another report found that 40% of children in Iraq did not think life was worth living. So all this was compounded with the status of school facilities, not enough schools, no running water, no functioning toilets in schools, lawlessness and unemployment. Um, um, so, there you have it. <laughs> Once again, um, children, sort of the, the American, this time the American agenda coming on the backs of the children, using the children as political capital, but as Madeleine Albright said, uh, it's worth it that um, their lives are not worthy, worth or equal to the children of um, American children. Um, so, to, oh, sorry. Um, this is that video clip again, but you remember it. Uh, a possible lesson idea for Iraq and for the American um, empire in the Middle East. Um, one of the just is this uh, a lesson plan, which is already uh, created. Um, it's part of the justification of the 2003 war, a US war on Iraq, was that Iraq harbored weapons of mass destruction and was breeding terrorists uh, who did 9-11. Um, and they were doing it in schools. And um, so what you could have your students do is, there's this notion that, you know, um, children don't deserve it. They don't deserve what we deserve. Um, and it's worth it because they are so different th than us in the West. Um, so I, you could have them, your students do a survey of educational institutions in the Middle East. And um, that is actually right here. I pulled it up. You can find it. Uh, it's a whole lesson plan, actually, I made uh, a few years ago. Um, it has the objectives, the materials, like the hook, how to instruct. You'll have access to all this. Um, but it, it helps the students then see what, how children are being used in various points in Middle East uh, history, leading up to, of course, the Iraq War. Um, and other catastrophes of um, American imperialism, see how the children are being made and remade through these education systems. But you can look, peruse this on your own time. So now we will just conclude. Um, in the conclusion, I wanted to say that um, I've not moved in this lecture. I've not moved through linear historical time. I've not shown like that children, or this, in this chronological moment, then this happened to them, and this happened, and this happened. What I've done instead is I've tried to look at the child in various overlapping moments uh, to make methodological and analytical points to help you think about children in the modern Middle East. So methodologically, I've attempted to move the focus of the historian away from the autonomous adult individual as the driver of the maker of the modern Middle East, to looking at how other groups like children are implicated in making history. Analytically, I've attempted to show how children or the concept of age is implicated in power play. We often think of politics as something that's the high and the mighty, but we must keep in mind that power resides everywhere, even in age categories. Um, and um, ultimately, of course, the intent 
is for you to get your students um, to be encouraged to think and be self-reflective of how they of their own subjectivity and vulnerability um, to power play. Um, so a final lesson plan idea um, could be that you challenge your students to think methodologically about how to integrate diverse voices into history. Um, you, you could introduce your students to the field of oral history. Oral history is recorded interviews between a narrator with personal experience of historically significant events and a well-informed interviewer who are working together to add to the historical record by making a transcript that can be used like a primary source in an archive. <laughs> That's a lot of words, but I've put up here um, a link to a document which you can access, which is like a sort of a, a guide, a, yeah, a guide, a curriculum guide, which you can use for how to introduce oral history to students. And the goal being here, I'm saying to have your students develop ways of analytically thinking and methodologically thinking about how to include the voices or how to, which in this case includes children we've talked about today. Um, and then if you want to get them to engage with this idea of children and childhood being used as political capital, uh, they could, your students could possibly engage in oral history projects with immigrants living in the United States that have come from the Middle East. Um, your students could collect the, le the life stories of an immigrant. And what I would encourage you to have the students do is not to, um, what you'll see in this curriculum guide and also a supplement a oral history video I've provided, is not to have your students you know, sit down and say, you know, tell me what politics were in your childhood, but instead to let the, the person they're interviewing talk about their life story um, and ask very open-ended questions about family members, where their ancestors were from, stories they heard growing up, games they played, education, you know, what were the subjects they studied? What were the holidays they celebrated? What were mealtimes like? Historical events, did they affect you? And then after the students do all this, this interview and make their transcript, then going back and looking in it at ways and where there are these uh, indications that children and childhood are um, shaping and making uh, the world and being used as political capital, uh, of course, paying attention to um, differences in race, class, and gender as well in experiences of childhood. So that is that. I will leave it at that. And you're welcome to interview or email me or um, access this PowerPoint for more um, questions. Thank you.